Welcome back to Math 11a. Uh, this is week five of the class, I think. Uh, this week we're getting into derivatives. Uh, today we're going to talk about derivatives in terms of slopes of tangent lines and giving the uh, limit definition of derivative. This will also serve as a bit of a review of some limits that have kind of a zero over zero form. Um, so I'll, we'll see those along the way. Uh, it's also the week when you're concentrating your midterm exams, so I'm going to try to keep it kind of a lighter week, even though there is a kind of a fundamental new uh, concept coming up. Here we go. So we're going to begin today by answering kind of the first real kind of derivative calculus problem that you might see. The problem is, what is the equation of the tangent line to y equals x squared at the point 1, 1? So what this question is asking about is the following. So I've drawn the parabola whose graph is, which is the graph of the equation, y equals x squared. And the point 1, 1 is on that parabola because 1 squared is equal to 1. And this question is asking about the equation of the tangent line to the parabola at that point. So here using my sketch pad, I can look at various lines that go through that point. And most of the lines that I draw will intersect the parabola in two points. So the point 1, 1 and some other point that's kind of moving along the parabola here. Even if I go farther this way, it's still actually going to intersect the parabola in two points, just one is kind of off the screen at the top. But there's one kind of key slope where if I go exactly at that slope, the line just kind of glances off that point and then goes onwards. It does not intersect the parabola in any other points. So this line here is called the, the tangent line. I've drawn it in blue here. And the question is asking about the equation of that tangent line. This is a line, so it has some equation. And what is it? Now, first you should remember the um, point slope sort of formula for a line. So the equation has the form Remember, there's y equals mx plus b, slope-intercept form, and there's also point-slope form, which has would be written y minus 1 is equal to the slope times x minus 1. This is the y-coordinate of the point 1, 1, and this is the x-coordinate of the point 1, 1. That's where these two 1s come from, and we'll see other examples of this as well. So you might want to review or look up. point slope uh, form for a line or point slope equation for a line you might see it called and what we don't know right now is the slope we don't know the slope of this blue line if we knew the slope we'd know the equation of the tangent line this is called the tangent line uh, we can kind of eyeball it so if you remember you know we can have our little person here mimicking the slope and see, okay, here the slope is just a little bit bigger than zero. And up here, the slope looks kind of steep. This is a pretty steep slope, so we might guess that it's more than one. Maybe it's two, maybe it's three or something. But how do we actually find the slope on the nose. This is where limits come in. So the idea is to look very, very close to this point. So I'll draw the point here again. And there's a curve going through that point. And then there's a blue line that's kind of glancing off that point. And we want to know the slope of the blue line. And the way we can do this is we can think about rise over run. Because that's what slope is, is it's the rise of a line divided by the run of the line. And 
this is the same no matter where we are on this blue line. And the point is, is that this point is 1, 1, and the point here is going to be very close to the point on the curve. As I get closer and closer to this point, this top point on the line is going to be very close to this top point on the curve. If I go too far away, the curve bends away, but as the curve gets closer and closer to this point, this point gets much closer to the point above it. So now if we want to do rise over run, we can now think of this as the limit, as the run gets closer and closer to zero. So as the x distance gets closer to zero of the rise over the run, and the rise here will be pretty close to the rise that we get from the curve, which would be uh, 1 plus the run squared minus 1. I'll show you where this comes from in a minute. And that would be the rise, and the run would be the run itself. Here's run. Where did this 1 plus run squared minus 1 come from? Well, if we look at this, this is x-coordinate 1. If we move over a little bit here, the x-coordinate is 1 plus the run. The y-coordinate here is 1. The y-coordinate for 1 plus run would be 1 plus run squared. Because I'm looking at the graph of the equation, y equals x squared. So this is on my x-axis. This is on my y-axis. So what I'm doing is I'm letting the run go towards zero, and I'm looking at the rise over the run, but kind of in an approximate way. I'm actually overestimating the rise, but that estimate gets closer and closer to correct as this point tends towards this point, as the run goes to zero. Now, mathematicians don't like using a whole word like run for a variable. So instead, what we do is we call that run variable h. So instead of that, we call it the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 plus h squared minus 1 over h. And this is a limit that we can do. If we just plug in h equals 0, we get 0 over 0, which is undefined. But the limit, remember, is something about what happens as h approaches 0. And so I'll do some algebra first. 1 plus h squared is 1 plus 2h plus h squared. Then I subtract a 1, and I divide by h. And this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. Now, 1 minus 1 cancels, and I'm left with h squared plus 2h on top. And now I can cancel my h's because h is not equal to 0, it's just approaching 0. So that's the limit as h approaches 0 of h squared over h is h, 2h over h is 2. And now this approaches 2 as h approaches 0. h approaches 0 and 2 just stays at 2, so this is equal to 2. So the slope, by this limiting argument, which I'll say more about in a minute, is equal to 2. And so the equation, then, of this blue line is y minus 1 is equal to 2 times x minus 1. 2 is the slope, this m. If we want to simplify this a little bit, I could add 1 to both sides and it becomes y is equal to 2x minus 2 plus 1, which is minus 1. So my artistic skills might not have been up to the job of explaining the relationship between the slope of the tangent line and this kind of funny looking limit that we had. So I've decided to do this also in Desmos. And what I've started with is the graph of the function y equals x squared. That's the parabola here. It touches zero right here. This is the called the 
axis of the parabola, this vertical line. Uh, so it touches zero here. And when x is equal to one, y is equal to one. I've kind of scaled the axes a little bit differently. Notice the x-axis here goes from negative three to three, and the y-axis goes from zero to five right up there. So this is the point one, one. I've just uh, scaled things down to make them a little easier to see. Now Desmos is nice because it allows you to use sliders. So I can actually move this point here. Um, one second. Using this slider, I can move this point left and right along the parabola. But let's just start at one where I had uh, had it before. Then what I can do is I can also look at another point. Let's call it a plus h, a plus h squared on the parabola. When, let's take h to be 0.5. So when h is 0.5, I've found this other point whose x coordinate is a plus h and whose y coordinate is a plus h quantity squared. This point lies on the parabola because the y coordinate is the square of the x coordinate. This is my x now, it's my a plus h. My x squared is a plus h squared. Here's a is 1, and a plus h here is 1.5. The square of a plus h is something like 2 and a quarter. That's why this purple point lies where it is. And Desmos is nice for being able to kind of uh, move these points back and forth. It even has a little movie player button so you can keep it moving like that. And now what I want to do is I'm going to look at the line that joins these two points. So I'll draw a line through the blue point and the purple point. Here it is. This is this blue line. This blue line is not a tangent line. It's what's called a secant line. It crosses this curve in two points. It crosses the curve at the blue point and the purple point. Still, the slope of this blue line is pretty close to the slope of the parabola. And was, when h moves closer and closer to zero, meaning that the purple point moves closer and closer to the blue point, this blue line, the secant line, gets closer and closer to the tangent line. So this slope that we have for the blue line gets close to the slope of the parabola as h approaches zero. As h approaches zero, the purple point at a plus h approaches the blue point at a. So this is the idea of finding the slope of the tangent line by letting an x-coordinate cl get closer and closer to my a, which is one here, and tracing through what the slope of this secant line is. And the slope ends up being given by this formula, a plus h squared minus a squared, that's the rise, and though the run is just h itself. I can try this at any point in the parabola, so I can move the whole picture over and still play this game, fixing the blue point, letting the purple point get closer, and figuring out the slope by using the slope of this blue line as it approaches, as h approaches zero. So for example, when a is zero, the slope here should definitely be zero, and as the purple point moves closer, the blue line becomes flatter. The slope becomes zero. If, we're, if we take a point here, say at negative two, then we see that the slope of the tangent line is negative. And we can compute this by letting, taking a limit as this purple point approaches the blue point. So next I'll show you how to do this formulaically for any point along the parabola. So I want to generalize what I did last time. And I want to answer the question, what is the slope of the tangent line to the parabola y equals x squared at any point x, y lying on the parabola? So imagine we have any point. Its coordinates would be x, y, and y would have to be x squared. So the coordinates would be x and x squared. What is the slope of the tangent line? Let's see if I can draw a tangent line here. That looks pretty good. What is the slope of a tangent line like this going to be? Now, one case that we figured out is the case when x and y are both 1. The slope is 
a limit that we computed before, the slope is 2. But what about a general xy? Really, a general x comma x squared. What's the slope there going to be? Well, the idea is the same. If we start at a point x and x squared, and we move over to the right, a little distance called h, and then we move up to the point on the parabola, whatever point that is, the x-coordinate of this point will be x plus h because I've moved to the right h units. On the vertical side, well, the y-coordinate will be x plus h squared because I lie on the parabola, y-coordinate is equal to the x-coordinate squared. So the slope will be the limit as h approaches 0 of the rise divided by the run in this little triangle. So the rise here will be the y-coordinate difference, which is x plus h squared minus x squared, this is the rise, divided by the run, which is h. So this quantity, x plus h quantity squared minus x squared, that is equal to the rise, that's this part here. And h is the horizontal distance here. So the rise over the run gets me the slope of the line through these two points. And that will be very close to the slope of the tangent line. And when h is approaching 0, this slope will actually approach the slope of the tangent line on the nose. So this means that we have to figure out the slope will be the limit, then, as h approaches 0, of x plus h quantity squared minus x squared over h. And here I'll do the work. This, like most limits that you'll see in derivatives, this is kind of a 0 over 0 kind of problematic limit. We have to do the algebra before we really do any plugging in. As x approaches 0, as I'm sorry, as h approaches 0, this is the same as the limit. I expand the top, x plus h squared is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Then I subtract an x squared all over h. My x squareds cancel, and I'm left with the limit as h approaches 0 of 2xh plus h squared divided by h. Since h is not equal to 0, it's just approaching 0, I can cancel the h's. And this is the limit as h approaches 0. 2xh over h is 2x. And h squared over h is just h. And h, as it approaches 0, 2x plus h approaches 2x, because the h approaches 0 here. And so this is equal to... Now I'm actually evaluating the limit, 2 times x. So the slope of the tangent line at a point x, y is going to be 2 times the x-coordinate. This is the answer to the question here. It seems maybe a little weird to have something symbolic like this. But notice this is what we found. When x equals 1, the slope was 2 times 1. If x were negative 1, we'd find slope negative 2. If x were 3, we'd find slope 6 for this tangent line. That's how it works. Now I can show you this in Desmos as well if you like, so it'll take me a minute to put up. Here I'm back in Desmos. 
let's get rid of everything for a moment. If I look at a point, a a squared, and I'll add a little slider, then the equation for the uh, tangent line through that point will have the form y minus a squared is equal to a slope. And the slope is going to be 2 times the x-coordinate and then x minus a. Um, if you're not used to reading this, this is like y minus y naught. So I'm looking at a point a a squared. y minus y naught is equal to the slope times x minus x naught. This is point slope form for a line, just with symbols instead of the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate, and the slope here. 2a is the slope. And if I move this point around, we can see that that line is always tangent. So 2 times a is always the slope at the point a comma a squared. That's the point that I want to make here. That's why this green line is perfectly following the parabola, and it captures the slope nicely. So this brings us to the general notion of the derivative of a function. So let's let f be a function. The derivative of f is the new function which is called f prime. This is how you pronounce it. You say f prime given by the formula f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. That's if this limit exists. Now, this kind of crazy looking formula, it should at least remind you of what we just computed for x squared. What we just computed for x squared was something with like an x plus h squared minus an x squared divided by an h. It's the same thing. So let's see what this really means. So f prime of x is the slope of the tangent line to the curve or to the graph of the function f at the point or through the point at coordinates x f of x. So if we look at what this means, if we have some sort of function f of x, here's its graph, we take some point, say x, and the y-coordinate will be f of x, that's how graphs work, and we take a nearby point, this will be x plus h, f of x plus h, if I'm close by, and we try to figure out the slope of the line through these two points, the x difference is h. I've moved from x to x plus h, so this distance is h. The vertical distance is the difference in the y-coordinates. And so this quantity that you see here, this f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, that's the slope of the line through these two points. And as these points get closer together, 
as h approaches 0, this line through the two points approaches the tangent line at this single point. And so that's why we define the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f by this limit formula. And what's left, after I kind of allow h to approach 0, there's still this variable x hanging around. And so I really get a new function, this f prime, which depends on x. The slope of the tangent line certainly depends on the x where I start this process. If I look at an x that's right here, I might get the slope to be 0. Over here, it looks like the slope will be a little bit positive. If I'm up here, the slope will be even greater. So f prime of x captures the slope of the tangent line, and it's given by this formula involving limits. This is one to memorize. So I don't say that too often, but for calculus, this definition of the derivative is something that you should memorize. And really, there should be two things floating in your head simultaneously. This formulaic definition, which will allow us to compute derivatives, and this kind of qualitative meaning in terms of slopes of tangent lines. There's one other interpretation in terms of rates of changes, and we'll do more on that next time. So to finish today, I want to compute two derivatives. One of them is more qualitative. You can figure it out by kind of looking at it. And the other is more formulaic. We'll have to actually do some significant algebra to figure it out. So the first one, this qualitative one, I want to look at the function f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. And the graph of this, this is kind of an archetype function, which you should know. It's the one that kind of goes, uh, has kind of a v-shape to it. So the absolute value of 0 is 0. The absolute value of 1 is 1. The absolute value of 2 is 2. And so in the right half, the graph looks like a straight line. And on the left half, well, it also looks like a straight line, but the angle is at uh, negative 45 degrees instead of 45 degrees, because the absolute value of negative 1 is 1, and the absolute value of negative 2 is 2, and the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. So it goes kind of up this way instead of continuing down. So this is what the graph of f of x equals the absolute value of x looks like. Now, understanding the derivative of this function means understanding the slope of this function. And I said tangent line, but maybe that's not exactly accurate, because I'm really looking for the slope at any point of this graph. The lines won't actually be tangent in the sense that they'll actually overlap this graph. So let's look at the limiting definition instead. f prime of x will be the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h, so that's the absolute value of x plus h, minus the absolute value of x, that's f of x, divided by h. If this went too fast, then maybe pause the video, go back a little bit, and copy down the definition of the derivative in terms of f of x plus h, f of x, and h. And then copy that on a sheet of paper and compare it to what I've written here to see that it's actually the same thing. So this is the definition of f prime of x. And what happens in this limit is, well, if we take a point on the right side, say this is our x, and we move over a little bit to x plus h, then the y-coordinate will also be x, and the y-coordinate here will be x plus h, because taking absolute values of um, of positive numbers doesn't really do anything to them. So this is x, this is x plus h, this is x, this is x plus h. It's the same as the absolute values. So if x is positive, this is really just the limit as h approaches 0 of x plus h, the absolute value of one positive number, minus x, the absolute value of another positive number, divided by h. The x's cancel. 
So this is the limit now as h approaches 0 of h over h, which is 1. Remember, it's not defined when h equals 0, but as h approaches 0, h over h is always 1. So when x is positive, the derivative is just 1. So here I'm going to plot the derivative. And at least when x is positive, the derivative is always 1. I don't know what happens at 0 yet, and I don't know what happens for negative numbers yet. So let's now look at what happens when x is negative. Well, actually, let's look at x equals 0 first. If x equals 0, then f prime of x is the limit as h goes to 0 of the absolute value of 0 plus h, which is the absolute value of h, minus the absolute value of 0, divided by h. This is the limit as h approaches 0 of the absolute value of h divided by h. This is undefined. This is one that we've studied before. But it's undefined because the limit from the right is 1, and the limit from the left is negative 1. And since those limits aren't equal to each other, this kind of uh, overall limit does not exist. And therefore, the derivative, f prime of x, does not exist when x equals 0. There's a hole in the function right there. Now, what about when x is negative? Well, there, let's take a point here. This will be my x now. Here's x plus h. This is h. The y coordinate will be the absolute value of x. When x is negative, this is negative x. And the x-coordinate here, or the y-coordinate here, will be the absolute value of x plus h, which is the absolute value of a negative number. That's negative x minus h. So when x is negative, the absolute value of a negative number is the same as its negative. And the absolute value of x plus a little bit, that's still negative, will be negative x minus h. So the derivative then will be the limit as h goes to 0 of absolute value of x plus h, which is negative x minus h, minus the absolute value of x, which is minus x, divided by h. And this I can simplify. This is the limit as h goes to 0. Negative x minus negative x cancels, and I'm left with negative h over h. And h over h is 1 when h is approaching 0, not equaling 0, but approaching 0. So that's equal to negative 1. So the derivative is negative 1. when x is negative. So here's the graph of the absolute value function. It's this v-shaped graph. Here's the graph of its derivative. It's negative 1 for all negative x's. It's undefined when x equals 0. And it's positive 1 for all positive x's. Qualitatively, what this reflects is the fact that as I travel along this curve, well, it's not a curve, it's a line, I guess. As I travel along this line, I'm skating downhill here. The slope is negative 1 throughout this range. f prime of x captures that slope negative 1. At this point, there's no well-defined slope. There's no slope defined at a corner point. The function is not differentiable there. The derivative is not defined. But then as I go uphill,
my slope is one throughout this region. The slope is up at one. So this is kind of the qualitative way that I would do this. So with some practice, you can go directly from a graph like this to a graph of its derivative by looking at slopes. And to really be sure that you're right, you can actually compute all these limits, which is more time consuming, but you can be more sure of your result. So I'll do one more that's more algebraic, and then we'll call it a day. To, so to finish today, we're gonna compute the derivative of the function f of x equals square root of x. We're gonna answer the question, what is f prime of x? Qualitatively speaking, or conceptually speaking, what we're doing is we're figuring out the slope of the line tangent to the graph of y equals the square root of x at a given point, a point whose coordinates are x comma root x. We're answering the question, what's the slope of this line? If I stand right here, with my arm sticking up just at the slope of this curve, what is that slope? And the answer is given by the limit. This is the definition of the derivative, the limit definition. It's the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h. f of x plus h means where we see an x, we put an x plus h. minus f of x, which is the square root of x, divided by h. And this is kind of a difficult type of limit, but we've seen them before. And there's a reason that the textbook introduces these limits earlier. One way to solve these is by multiplying top and bottom by the sum of these two square roots. It's the difference of squares trick. So this is the limit as h goes to zero of the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x, all divided by h times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. So what I've done here is this uh, trick in mathematics where I've taken a fraction and I've multiplied top and bottom by the same thing, which doesn't change a fraction. For example, if I take a fraction like one third, this is equal to one times 13 over three times 13. It's kind of like I've unreduced the fraction by multiplying by 13 over 13. Okay, so this is the algebraic trick here. And the reason that we do this, this is a trick. I don't know who first invented this trick, but it's just one that is uh, helpful for these kind of limits. If we take something minus something times something plus something, it's the difference of the squares. So remember that if we take two things, then their difference times their sum is equal to the square minus the square. And here, the square of the square root is just the thing. Root x plus h squared is x plus h minus the b squared, b is root x. So b squared is x. Here, I'm thinking of this as an expression of the form a minus b, a plus b. And here's my a squared minus b squared. a is the square root of x plus h. So its square is just x plus h and b is equal to my square root of x. So that's how I get from this line down to the top here. On the bottom, I still have the same thing. Now this is nice because my x's cancel and I'm left with an h on top and an h on bottom. So everything from here on out gets easier rather than harder. For a while, you're making something look worse before it looks better. So this is the limit of h divided by h times that mess. And my h is now cancel, and I'm left with one on top and one on bottom. 
So this is the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 divided by the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. Now this bottom here, this is defined as long as x is positive. As h approaches 0, root x plus h is just approaching root x. This is root x. So this is equal to 1 divided by 2 root x's. Root x plus root x is 2 times the square root of x. This is if x is greater than 0. If x is equal to 0, then I have something of the form 1 over 0, which is bad. If x is less than 0, I have square roots of negative numbers, which is bad. But as long as x is greater than 0, this is what this limit is. And so that's what f prime of x is. f prime of x, the derivative function, is 1 over twice the square root of, it, of x. This might also be written as 1 half. 1 over the square root of x is the same as x to the negative 1 half power. The 1 half power has the effect of square rooting the x, and the negative puts it in the denominator. So you'll see either one of these written, 1 over twice the square root of x, or half of x to the negative 1 half. So that's the derivative of the square root function.